Toby Bishop. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Today's talk is about accessory liability. Now, we have a brief disclaimer there saying this isn't legal advice, etc. You'll be familiar with it if you've joined any of our seminars before. Now, what I'm going to do is stop the slideshow and then um, right at the end, I'll put up a slide, which is the citations for any of the authorities that I've been referring to. But until then, I'm afraid you just get uh, a picture of me or me and Joe, uh, if you prefer. Now, it's going to be a talk in three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about dishonest assistance. Secondly, knowing receipt. And thirdly, the uh, Court of Appeals judgment in Group 7 and Notable Services last year, which was a decent example of both. So dishonest assistance. We have uh, quite a helpful um, distillation of the principles this year um, from the Privy Council. So the opinion of Lord Hodge uh, in Magna and RBS Gibraltar in which he explains that in order to establish a claim for dishonest assistance, a claimant must show that, number one, there was a trust. Number two, there was a breach of trust by the trustee. Number three, the defendant assisted in the breach. And number four, that the defendant did so dishonestly. Now, if you have all of those elements, then your defendant is pinned with personal liability to account as though they were the trustee. So it really is a powerful tool. The times when you'll be considering it are, if for example, um, your trustee uh, has misapplied the property and, and you can't any longer uh, trace where it is, they may have moved it through offshore vehicles, they may have become insolvent, it may have been paid to their creditors, etc. Um, and it is a great opportunity to pin someone else, somebody with assets or somebody with insurance, with that liability. So let's consider the four elements. First, that there was a trust. It's relatively straightforward. It doesn't apply um, simply to uh, a conventional trust um, that you will be familiar with. It, of course, extends to estates, but it also extends to constructive trusts and resulting trusts and to all sorts of other fiduciary obligations and arrangements. So um, it'll extend to an agency relationship or a uh, company director or a nominee. You can, this, this wouldn't usually be the bit that presents you with the difficulty. You are generally going to know um, whether or not you've got a trust. It's just worth being aware of, of the breadth of its application to try and bring it in perhaps to a case where other people haven't noticed it. Second, that you have a breach. Now, again, most of you on this are going to know what a breach of trust is and what it looks like. But it's important to be aware that there is that the, that the state of mind of the trustee who has committed the breach is totally irrelevant. And we get that from what is probably the most important decision in this field, the case of Royal Brunei and Tan in 1995. And in that, uh, the, the opinion of the Privy Council uh, was delivered by um, Lord Nichols, and it would later be described by um, Lord Millet in the House of Lords as magisterial. Um, it is worth reading. Royal Brunei itself uh, was an airline, or perhaps still is, I'm not sure, uh, and it appointed a local agent um, to sell passenger and cargo space, effectively, and the agent did its job, it sold that space, and so it collected money on behalf of its principal money that was held on trust for rural Brunei. But what it did was mix it with its own funds and start applying the agent, that is, start applying it for the agent's own purposes. And the agent then became insolvent. Mr. Tan was the managing director of the agent. And the reason why it reached the Privy Council was that the court, uh, uh, that the local court of appeal um, concluded that because the, uh, the claimant, the airline, could not establish dishonesty or, or fraudulent conduct on the part of the company, uh, Mr. Tan couldn't be pinned with liability. Now, short answer is that is wrong. Um, but Lord Nichols explained it in this way. Their Lordship's overall conclusion is that dishonesty is a necessary ingredient of accessory liability. It is also a sufficient ingredient. A liability in equity to make good resulting loss attaches to a person who dishonestly procures or assists in a breach of fiduciary obligation. It is not necessary 
that in addition, the trustee or fiduciary was acting dishonestly. So that is important. It doesn't matter what the trustee has done. And, and, and interestingly, uh, in fact, um, the person who brings, the person with the standing to bring this, um, this claim will frequently be the trustee. Now, most of the time, that's going to be a replacement trustee, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it could in fact be the trustee who themselves committed the breach. Um, and that might happen. You might, you might think it's unlikely, but uh, that might happen if, for example, um, they have not been in any way dishonest, they have perhaps been negligent, um, or if there's an exoneration clause, um, which in fact protects them from liability, the beneficiaries may well think that leave, leave them to, to try and make good their mistake. So the next thing to have in mind in relation to a breach is that there is no requirement uh, that there's been a misapplication of trust property. So this could involve um, simply diverting a profit to some third party, or it could involve somebody taking a bribe or making a secret profit themselves. Um, it doesn't need, uh, it's, it's, it's not receipt based. So it doesn't involve sort of an asset of the property falling into somebody else's hands necessarily. The liability to account can arise um, without that. So the third element is the assistance or inducement. So in your authorities, you'll find inducement, procurement, assistance. It is somehow making this breach happen. And um, it's causation, really. Did this defendant cause the breach? So it's a question of fact. There is no mental element to it. There's no subjective element. And group seven and notable, which we'll come on to a little bit later, explains it in this way. On authority, the matter must be approached in two ways, uh, my project, in two stages. It must be shown that the conduct in fact assisted the breach of trust and that the loss directly resulted from the breach of trust. The test at the first stage is that the assistance must be more than minimal. The test at the second stage is that the loss in fact resulted from the breach of trust. Now, we've got a bit more clarification this year. Um, Mr. Justice Snowden, in the case of uh, Bilter against NatWest Markets in 2020, uh, this was a um, this was people selling um, carbon carbon notes, I think. Um, so, Mr. Justice Snowden explains it is uh, sufficient for the ingredient of assistance is simply conduct which in fact assists the fiduciary to commit the act which constitutes the breach of trust or fiduciary duty. Accordingly, if the defendant's conduct provides no assistance and does not enable the breach to be committed at all, or if it played no more than a minimal role in enabling the breach to be committed, there will be no liability. It is not necessary, however, to show that what is done by the defendant inevitably has the consequence that loss is suffered. It is also not an answer to the claim for dishonest assistance to show that the breach of trust or fiduciary relationship would have occurred in any event, regardless of whether the assistance was provided. Now that tells us all we need to know, I think, about, uh, about the, the, the practical aspect of assistance. And the final element, though, is dishonesty. And this really is the most, uh, I, think it's, I think it's the most important aspect of this. It is certainly the most um, controversial and I would suggest the most interesting. It's the cornerstone. And interestingly, it has flummoxed <laughs> the, the courts at the very highest level. Um, so, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. Um, Lord Nichols, uh, I've already referred to in, in the uh, Royal Brunei case, he explained it in this way. It means simply not acting as an honest person would in the circumstances. The standard of what constitutes honest conduct is not subjective. Honesty is not an optional scale. The higher or lower values according to the moral standards of each uh, is not an optional scale with higher or lower values according to the moral standards of each individual. If a person knowingly appropriates another's property, he will not escape a finding of dishonesty simply because he sees nothing wrong in such behaviour. This, we in some places, is sort of referred to as the, or that last place is referred to as the sort of Robin Hood standard. Robin Hood knew he was stealing, they thought he had a perfectly good reason for it. 
So the law as to dishonesty, that was in 1995, if you remember, Royal Brunei. So the law as to dishonesty, though, took a, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a wrong turn in the House of Lords. So by a majority of the House of Lords, in the case of Twin Sector and Yardley in 2002, everybody in the House of Lords was trying, were agreed, it seems, that, uh, that, uh, that Lord Nichols uh, was right in Royal Brunei. Um, what they didn't agree about was um, what it was that he was actually saying. Um, so Lord Millet uh, gave the dissenting judgment in that, and we'll come back to Lord Millet's judgment a few times probably, because it effectively has been proved to be correct, and it is very useful uh, in relation to lots of points. It explains, for example, how a quiz close trust works, it's got some useful points about um, knowing receipts, and although it's not quite been clearly stated, in these terms since, Lord Millet was right about dishonest assistance and what dishonesty means. But the, the judgment with which everyone else agreed was Lord Hutton's speech. But Lord Hoffman briefly summarised what it was that Lord Hutton was saying. Lord Hoffman said, I consider that those principles require more than knowledge of the facts which make the conduct wrongful. They require a dishonest state of mind, that is to say, consciousness, that one is transgressing ordinary standards of honest behavior. Now that, that consciousness, that is subjective, isn't it? There can't really be much doubt about that. Um, but a mere three years later in the Privy Council, in the case of Barlow, Clowes International and Eurotrust, um, so 2005, I have it down as 2005, which was the massive, the massive pension fraud on the Isle of Man. Um, and if anyone joined in um, the talk on domicile, you'll remember one of the Barlow Clowes cases um, came up in that. Um, but essentially the Privy Council, this is the Privy Council again, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on this occasion consisted of Lord Nichols, who you'll remember from Royal Brunei, but also Lords Hoffman and Stain, uh, for who were both in um, Twin Sector. And the opinion is given by Lord Hoffman. Um, now, they are dancing round uh, what Twin Sector means. So Lord Hoffman said, their lordships accept that there is an element of ambiguity in these remarks, the ones I've just referred to, which may have encouraged a belief expressed in some academic writings that, Twin Sector, that the Twin Sector case had departed from the law as previously understood and invited inquiry, not merely into the defendant's mental state about the nature of the transaction in which he was participating, but also into his views about generally accepted standards of honesty. Now, if we just remind ourselves of what Lord Hoffman said in Twin Sector, uh, they require a dishonest state of mind. That is to say, consciousness that one is transgressing ordinary standards of honest behavior. But, uh, in Barlow Clowes, he's explaining that that is not quite what it meant. So he, he explains in Barlow Clowes, goes on in Barlow Clowes, uh, but they do not consider that this is what Lord Hutton meant. The reference to what he knows would offend normally accepted standards of honest conduct meant only that his knowledge of the transaction had to be such as to render his participation contrary to normal, normally acceptable standards of honest conduct. Now, it is a slightly peculiar position um, to have many of the same uh, uh, law lords uh, saying a mere three years later that what they said was not quite what they meant. Um, but this was all tidied up. And, and, and of course, you had the additional problem that when they were saying a thing which was not quite what they meant, they were sitting in the House of Lords, which is, of course, the highest authority. Um, and when they were saying what they in fact meant, they happened to be sitting in the Privy Council, which um, is persuasive, although extremely persuasive, of course. Uh, but this was all tidied up by uh, the case of Phil Ivey. Um, so Ivey and Genting, or Gen yes, Genting, I think, casinos uh, in the Supreme Court in 2017. Um, and this was a case um, being run by, many of you will know him, um, uh, Ryan from Kingsley Napoli. So Ivey was a came, case by, a uh, claim by a professional gambler, Phil Ivey, to recover winnings um, of seven and a half million. Uh, which he had amassed using an edge sorting strategy. So Lord Hughes unified the test for dishonesty. And he explained it in this way. When dishonesty is in question, the fact-finding tribunal must first ascertain subjectively 
the actual state of the individual's knowledge or belief as to the facts. The reasonableness or otherwise of his belief is a matter of evidence, often in practice determinative, going to whether he held the belief, but it is not an additional requirement that his belief must be reasonable. The question is whether it was genuinely held. When, once his actual state of mind as to knowledge or belief, uh, when, when, his, when his actual state of mind as to knowledge or belief as to, as to facts is established, the question whether his conduct was honest or dishonest is to be determined by the fact finder by applying the objective standards of ordinary decent people. There is no requirement that the defendant must appreciate that what he has done is by those standards dishonest. So stage one, you ascertain the state of mind of the person, of the defendant. Uh, number two, once you know all of those facts, once you know effectively his state of mind, you judge him by an objective standard, whether or not an ordinary honest person would think that he was acting dishonestly. Now, to help us understand that in practice, Lord Hughes um, gave us a couple of examples, but he referred back to um, uh, the criminal case in the Court of Appeal, we gosh, where it was said that take, for example, a man who comes from a country where public transport is free. On his first day here, he travels on a bus. He gets off without paying. He never had any intention of paying. His mind is clearly honest, but his conduct, judged objectively by what he has done, is dishonest. It seems to us that in using the word dishonesty in the Theft Act, Parliament cannot have intended to catch dishonest conduct in that sense. And Lord Hughes explains why that is. Because he, the man on the bus, genuinely believes that public transport is free, there is nothing objectively dishonest about his not paying on the bus. The same would be true of a child who did not know the rules, or of a person who had innocently misread the bus pass sent to him and did not realise that it did not operate until after 10 in the morning. What is objectively judged is the standard of behaviour given any known actual state of mind of the actor as to the facts. Now, before we leave dishonesty, we do have uh, an additional um, definition um, by the Privy Council this year in uh, Magna and RBS, the case that I've already referred to. And uh, I'll read that out as well, uh, because it's a, very, it's a very tight summary and it's very useful to my mind. In this context, dishonesty can be subjective in the sense that the defendant knew that what he was doing was dishonest, but that subjective understanding is not necessary to establish dishonesty. Honesty in this context is an objective standard because it is sufficient that the defendant's knowledge of the transaction rendered his participation in it contrary to normally acceptable standards of honest conduct. Those are the elements of dishonest assistance and we will see um, in group seven how they are applied to a particular set of facts, but also how um, they can be quite dramatically misunderstood by, by an experienced and well-regarded judge. So on to knowing receipt. Uh, the state of the law on knowing receipt is to my mind slightly less satisfactory uh, than the law on dishonest assistance. It is receipt-based rather than um, fault-based. And we get that from the dissenting judgment of Lord Millet into Incetra. There are three elements, essentially, and they've been identified uh, by Lord Justice Hoffman in the case, uh, as he then was, in the case of El Aju, uh, and Dollar Land Holdings in 1994. They require, first, disposal of assets in breach of fiduciary duty. Second, beneficial receipt by the defendant of assets which are traceable as representing the assets of the claimant. Third, knowledge on the part of the defendant that the assets are traceable to a breach of fiduciary duty. So we'll take those three in turn. The first, disposal of assets in breach of trust. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it's what we've already talked about in relation to dishonest assistance. So the second part is slightly more interesting. That's beneficial receipt of assets or traceable proceeds. So the knowing receipt element, now that you, the, 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 uh, the trustee or the personal representative or the principal may well have a, um, 
proprietary claim um, over this property. But what we're actually talking about here is the personal um, remedy um, to an account. So the defendant must have received the property for his own use and benefit. And that term we get from LAJU, um, but it's also uh, been approved by the House of Lords approved by the House of Lords in the dissenting judgments of Lord Millicent to Inceptra. It means that you're not liable, or the defendant is lot not liable, uh, if they received it as an agent. And the term for that is ministerial receipt. And that term, ministerial receipt, is worth remembering. So if, if, if the agent merely receives it on behalf of their principal, and that agent might be a bank or it might be a lettings agent, it could be all sorts of different people, the agent is not liable, the principal. Is going to be liable. Now the claim is against those who have received the trust property. So there's no claim, well the trust property or its traceable proceeds, but there's no claim against a bona fide purchaser for value without notice. So that, that's equities darling. Um, so if the property passes, the property is in the hands of equities darling or it has passed through um, that person's hands at some stage, then the right is going to be lost. And we get that from, well, from lots of different places, but Acres and Samba um, in uh, the Supreme Court in 2017. Now, the liability is also fixed at receipt. So if the, uh, so, so, so if once the, uh, the recipient has the property in their hands um, and uh, with knowledge that it is, or with sufficient knowledge that it is um, the proceeds of a breach of trust, they can't, you know, it's no good playing sort of hot potato. They can't just throw it onto someone else and say, well, it's your problem now. Um, they are fixed with it when they receive it or when they receive it and they have the knowledge. Um, so, so you can go after them even if the property is no longer in their hands. Now, knowledge, knowledge is the bit that is difficult, much like um, dishonesty is the interesting bit um, in dishonest assistance, although it is interesting and resolved. Uh, knowledge is interesting and a little bit um, has it has a greater scope for, for further argument and clarification. We had in 2001, so 19 years ago now, BCCI and Akindele. And so within, within that judgment, judgment given by uh, Lord Justice Norse, with whom the rest of the court agreed, the principles were identified in this way. Um, knowing, uh, knowing receipt requires uh, well, the, uh, these are the key elements. Dishonesty is not a necessary ingredient of liability in knowing receipt. Just as now there is a single test of dishonesty, at the time he was referring to the, the case of Royal Brunei and Tan, um, for, knowing for, for, for knowing assistance, which at the time is the term he was using for dishonest assistance, so ought there to be a single test of knowledge for knowing receipt. All that is necessary is that the recipient's state of knowledge should be such as to make it unconscionable for him to retain the benefit of the receipt. A test in that form, though it cannot, any more than any other, avoid difficulties of application, ought to avoid those of definition and allocation to which the previous categorizations have led. Now, unconscionability, without more, uh, leaves considerable scope for argument and therefore considerable scope for litigation uh, and for uncertainty and I would suggest for appeals. The former test that Lord Justice Norse was referring to was that in the case of Barden, so Barden and um, Sokgen uh, in 1993. Now Barden had a scale uh, of dishonesty but this was at a time where the where dishonest assistance and knowing receipt had not clearly separated as distinct um, causes of action. And there was considerable overlap between um, the requirements, but also the terminology um, in the in, in the judgments. But the Barden scale was uh, in five parts. So at the one end of the scale, it was actual knowledge on the part of the defendant. Next, so that's number one. Number two, willfully shutting one's eyes to the obvious. Number three, 
willfully and recklessly failing to make such inquiries as an honest and reasonable man would make. Number four, knowledge of circumstances which would indicate the facts to an honest and reasonable man. Number five, knowledge of circumstances which would put an honest and reasonable man on inquiry. Now, that, um, that test has been, so it seems to me, fairly uh, clearly um, discredited, but it still appears in the uh, in, in, in the texts of most of the leading practitioners' texts, um, everything from Boasted and Reynolds to, to Lewin in various ways. But um, for example, Boasted and, Boasted, and, Boasted and Reynolds on agency, um, after noting uh, Lord Nichols' um, very firm rejection uh, that, of that test in Royal Blue Nine, says it remains nevertheless useful here, being in relation to knowing receipt, and elsewhere as a starting point, which draws attention to the problems likely to be encountered. Now, another text, the law of personal property, rightly identifies that BCCI and Akindele, that which I just read out, um, is the appropriate test. So that unconscionability is now the law, but gives more um, time and more text over to the, uh, to the Barnum scale um, than it does to unconscionability and gives a fairly strong indication that the, that the, uh, that the person drafting that part um, feels that the Barden scale is still uh, of some assistance. Um, Lewin sets out the Barden scale, then uh, goes on to say that in the context of dishonest assistance, the Barden classification ceased to be relevant following the decision of the Privy Council in Royal Brunei Airlines and TAM. So that, I mean, it was within within a year or so that, um, that it was discredited by the Privy Council. The classification continues to, continued for a time to be used in the context of knowing receipt, though the Court of Appeal then expressed grave doubts about its utility in the context as well. Despite those grave doubts, we continue to refer to the Barton classification in connection with knowing receipt, since it had been so widely used in past cases uh, in distinguishing between different types of knowledge that may suffice to impose liability and until further judicial guidance is given as to what kind of knowledge makes it unconscionable for a defendant to retain a receipt of trust property, it may still be useful in distinguishing between different types of knowledge for this purpose. Now, it's curious, isn't it, that the Court of Appeals say, well, the Privy Council say don't use it, the Court of Appeals say don't use it, and yet people continue to use it. In Snell's, Snell's equity refers to a sliding scale, um, and that, that, that sliding scale, uh, they, they cite for that proposition, a case called Armstrong and Winnington. Now, Armstrong and Winnington is a first instance decision from 2012, in which, well, effectively, uh, everybody involved in it, both the parties and the judge, seem to agree that the Barden scale is uh, the way of approaching unconscionability. Um, but I would, I would caution um, people against using the Barden scale too much, because I would suggest that it, it opens you up to uh, an attack on, on an appeal, because it has been very firmly discredited. So BCCI and Akindele point out, the Court of Appeal pointed out the following, two important points must be made about the Barden categorization. First, it appears to have been propounded by counsel for the plaintiffs, accepted by counsel for the defendants, and then put to the judge on an agreed basis. Secondly, though both counsel accepted that all five categories of knowledge were relevant, and neither sought to submit that there was any distinction for the purposes between knowing receipt and knowing assistance, a view which the judge expressed his agreement, with which the judge expressed his agreement. And then we also had the Court of Appeal um, last year in group seven, uh, explaining it in this way. The judge found assistance in the Barden scale of knowledge, despite its rejection by Lord Nichols in the context of dishonest assistance. What Lord Nichols actually said was that the Barden scale was best forgotten. And despite the grave doubts about its utility in cases of not knowing receipt expressed by Nor Seljay in Akindele. So it is, I, I do think it's surprising that people continue um, to rely on it, but then what else do you do with the rather abstract concept of unconscionability in relation to knowing receipt? 
but there you have the elements of knowing receipt. So let's move on to, um, to look at group seven. Uh, so group seven and notable. It's a useful example, um, partly because well, it's fairly recent, called a repeal in 2019. Um, the facts are quite fun, um, but it involves two professionals. Um, they are the defendants and they fall very narrowly either side of the line. One of them finds himself liable for, uh, to, to account personally for 12 million euros. The other one um, has no liability whatsoever and is still in practice. It's also important because the first instance judge, the trial judge, was Justice Morgan, um, the Court of Appeal decided, got it quite wrong. So the litigation was mammoth. <laughs> it, it had taken up, by the time it reached the Court of Appeal on this occasion, it had taken up um, 151 days of court time. There'd been trials in the Crown Court, in the High Court, and there'd been hearings in the Court of Appeal. But the facts can be stated fairly briefly. A Swiss oil services company acting through a subsidiary that's now called Group 7 had 100 million euros to invest. Swiss oil services apparently doing quite well. Uh, a fraudster, Mr. Luis Augusto Ramos Nobre, promised huge returns and regrettably Group 7 transferred the money into his control. Mr. Nobre then laundered the proceeds through a London multidisciplinary partnership called Notable Services. Notable's members, well, there were three partners, I think, but um, there was uh, Mr. Landman, who was an accountant, and Mr. Maduri, who was a solicitor. Now, Notable took advice from the Law Society and also from a, uh, from a firm specializing in, in money laundering um, as to what it should do. When the Metropolitan Police um, became involved, they intervened and they managed to recover 88 million uh, euros. So the shortfall was 12 million. So if we look first of all at Mr. Maduri, <clears throat> the claim against him was solely in respect of dishonest assistance. Um, the money had not come into his hands beneficially, and so there wasn't a, a knowing receipt claim. Now the judge can, made the following conclusions. He decided that Mr. Maduri um, lacked experience and preparedness, but sought and tried to follow advice. The judge described him as more dazzled than suspicious about the enormous amount of money he was dealing with and the exotic character and behaviour of Mr. Mowbray. Now, it was clear to Mr. Maduri that some of the payments were not for the investment purpose the fund was purportedly held for but the judge accepted Mr. Maduri's explanation. The judge said he believed that the loan agreement was simply a paper transaction between connected companies to allow Mr. Nobre to have the use of the money in the United Kingdom in a way which was tax efficient, as distinct from an arm's length loan intended to have provisions which had to be observed. I think it's rather surprising that the judge accepted that as an explanation. It seems to me to be just gump. Now, the judge concluded that in all the circumstances, effectively those, those two circumstances, he was dazzled and, uh, and, uh, and he thought that this was a sort of only slightly illegitimate transaction. He decided that, that Mr. Uh, Maduri had not been dishonest. Now, the court of, that, that, that decision was not appealed. Um, and the Court of Appeal uh, observed, after setting out some fairly lengthy passages from the judgment, <clears throat> that these were benevolent findings, which in the absence of an appeal, they were not in a position to criticise. Now that, reading between the lines, is a fairly strong indication that an appeal uh, might have succeeded in relation to uh, that finding. But if we move on to Mr Landman and dishonest assistance at the first instance, the judge found that he was not dishonest. Uh, the judge found that, well, he was not dishonest in the material sense. The judge found that he did have a propensity for dishonesty, that he lied deliberately at trial, that he consistently lied to his partners about his knowledge of the transaction, that he <clears throat> had himself described Mr. Nobre as a con man, but he didn't always think that Mr. Nobre was a fake, and that he hadn't deliberately refrained from asking questions proposed <clears throat> And he had proposed that the firm take specialist advice. 
Now, he did, however, pin Mr. Landman with knowing receipt because Mr. Nobring had paid Mr. Landman £170,000 personally uh, for his assistance. And he had disguised uh, that payment through a Panamanian corporate nominee. The judge found that uh, subjectively, Mr. Landman believed Mr. Nobre was entitled to the money. But, honest, but not, an honest and reasonable man would not have done so. He found that it was plainly unconscionable for Mr. Landman to retain the £170,000 because it had been obtained for deliberately and dishonestly breaking the solicitor's accounting rules and dishonestly misleading Notable as to his involvement in or knowledge of the transactions which led to Notable paying away some 15 million euros. Now, so Group 7 had achieved getting back from uh, Mr. Landman, £170,000, but they were still uh, out of pocket by a considerable amount of money, 11 plus million. <clears throat> so they appealed uh, on the dishonest assistance um, ground. Um, now, the Court of Appeal said that Mr. Justice Morgan had applied the wrong test. He had applied the Barden scale of dishonesty in relation to dishonest assistance. Now, since <laughs> The Barton scale of dishonesty, as it appears from earlier, was come up with by counsel, by someone like me, um, and then uh, accepted by someone else like me, and, and therefore the judge didn't interfere with it, a first instance judge. Um, and within two years, a Privy Council uh, law lord uh, had said um, that it should be best forgotten. So for um, Ms Justice Morgan to still be applying it, uh, however many years later, is... <clears throat> Understandably, the Court of Appeal thought that was unwise. Um, now, it was conceded in the Court of Appeal that Mr. Landman uh, had, had, that had Mr. Landman disclosed the £170,000 um, payment, that the transactions could not have proceeded. The Court of Appeal explained in this way it would have at once, uh, it would at once have been obvious that no reputable firm could have anything to do with such a client or his supposed wealth, nor would the firm advising about um, money laundering and the law society have advised as they did. The Court of Appeal described it as a striking feature of the judgment that the judge nowhere uses the word bribe to describe the undoubtedly corrupt payment which Mr. Landman negotiated with Mr. Nobbery. And so the Court of Appeal concluded that the clear logic of the judge's unchallenged findings in relation to Mr. Landman's receipt of the £170,000 is that Mr. Landman must have known, uh, must have been guilty of dishonest assistance of the breaches of trust and fiduciary duty. It was impossible to insulate his dishonesty in assisting the making of the payments out of the account from his uh, equally dishonest conduct in facilitating the initial receipt of the 100 million into the account. So it was said that the judge's error, in, uh, judge's error of approach fatally affected his analysis of Mr. Landman's conduct on the issue of dishonest assistance. And that if he had stood back and reviewed the position as a whole, the only conclusion to which he could reasonably have come is that Mr. Landman, Mr. Landman's whole course of conduct in relation to the 100 million from late October 2011 onwards was objectively dishonest. Now, the court, you'll, you'll remember also that um, Ms. Justice Morgan um, said that, uh, that, um, that Mr. Landman did not uh, intentionally decide not to ask questions and that he had um, encouraged the firm to take money laundering advice. So on that, the Court of Appeal said that uh, Mr. Landman's uh, efforts uh, were a cynical move designed to facilitate the receipt of 100 million into the client account as a first step to payment out, including the payment to him of a bribe of 170,000. But there's a very neat um, statement of the law as to uh, what's called blind eye knowledge, um, which is as follows. The imputation of blind eye knowledge requires two conditions to be satisfied. <clears throat> the first is, a, is the existence of a suspicion that certain facts may exist. And the second is a conscious decision to refrain from taking any step to confirm their existence. The existence of the suspicion is to be judged subjectively by reference to the beliefs of the relevant person. 
and the decision to avoid obtaining confirmation must be deliberate. I slightly prefer the way that uh, Lord Justice Millett put it in his dissenting judgment in Twin Sector. He said this, <clears throat> it is dishonest for a man deliberately to shut his eyes to facts which he would prefer not to know. If he does so, he is taken to have acted with, uh, is taken to have actual knowledge of the facts to which he shut his eyes. Such knowledge has been described as Nelsonian knowledge. Uh, after Admiral Lord Nelson um, putting the telescope to his blind eye and saying, I see no ships. Meaning knowledge which is attributable to a person as a consequence of his willful blindness, or as American lawyers describe it, contrived ignorance. I'm quite fond of the term contrived ignorance and Nelsonian knowledge. So that's why I'm ending that bit of it there. Um, group seven is, is interesting, I think, because uh, the end result is that Mr. Landman, well, Mr. Landman and uh, Mr. Maduri are both um, suckered by Mr. Nobre. And Mr. Nobre, you can sort of look him up on the internet. He is a, a he, he, he's quite a character, um, and he, he clearly is a most persuasive con artist. Um, they were both suckered by him, um, but Mr. Landman uh, ends up with a judgment against him for 12 million euros. Um, Mr. Midori uh, does not. Now, you may come across this, we're, we're about to finish this talk, but you may come across this in lots of different um, ways. You might be acting for beneficiaries um, of a trust that has been um, plundered in this way. Um, you might be acting for the trustees, the replacement trustees, the personal representatives, the replacement personal representatives. Um, you might even, I suppose, be acting for the for the miscreants. Although, if you are, you want to be a bit careful about how you're uh, how you're getting paid. Um, but it might just come up because one of your non-contentious clients or one of your non-contentious um, colleagues, you know, wants to run something past you, as as people sometimes do, and you you need to sort of have your ears and eyes open for this kind of behavior and where it presents itself you know the only your best your best tool um, is the thing that you're probably best at it's probably why you do the job you ask questions and you analyze the answers and what you need to have in mind of course is that a, a con artist in order to be successful is plausible they they are able to um, give responses that have a superficial um, sense of propriety about them, or they're able to deflect um, the, the inquiry. Um, they're able to place somehow place pressure on the person who's asked the question or put that person in an embarrassing position and cause them to have to fight a, a different fire. You know, these are sort of an elaborate con artist. Um, well, there are a number of uh, rather famous ones uh, in the world at the moment. Um, so you ask questions and when you get the answer don't accept it at face value there will almost invariably be follow-up questions and you will want to analyze the answer and as litigators we all know what you really need is documents you don't just need words so ask for the the supporting documents now if this is if this has come to you by way of a, a sort of chat with a non-contentious person of course exotic wealthy and eccentric clients are a charming um, aspect of our business um, and sometimes independent free thinkers are reluctant to um, you know get involved in what they perceive as red tape by answering these sort of things and coming up with the documents but essentially if they are in a fiduciary position then it is so it seems to be part of their duty to be able to produce um, the documents that justify what they're doing and there will come a time where if they can't or if they won't then you should not be involved now that i think is the end of our talk uh, i can't see if we have any um questions but what i'll do is i'll put up the list of authorities that i promised So that's here, um, and I've put them in chronological order. And if I leave that up for a, a few seconds, if anyone is sufficiently interested, 
um, then you can you know, take a screenshot on your device. Um, or if you want that list, then contact Joe or I and, um, and we can send it to you. So that's the final slide. As always, if you want to disagree with me about any of that, or um, just want to talk to me about any of it, then feel free. My number's there and my email address is there. Thank you all for listening.